Okay. Well, listen, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure today to reintroduce Dr. Monfred, who's a personal friend of mine, neurotologist at George Washington University, and uh, he's a professor there. He has a real interesting background. Um, I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but he is a uh, he went to Stanford University for medical school residency and did neurotology fellowship with Dr. Jackler and then took over the position at George Washington in Washington, D.C., where he's head of the department. And uh, his, his understanding of otology far exceeds 99% of us, and his ability to share that is tantamount to um, learning a hell of a lot. So all I want to say is it's great to have him back, and I hope everybody just you know pay sit back, pay attention, and absorb what he has to say because there's a lot of lot of pearls of wisdom here. So much okay. thanks for joining me. My pleasure. You're very kind as always, my friend. Um, so I was telling Richard that I have um, two presentations that uh, we can share. The these are uh, both uh, meant to be interactive. So. If you guys want, you can, you're welcome to turn on your cameras and um, um, that way we can, um, you know, have a discussion. Otherwise, it'll be very uh, uh, a boring presentation because I'm going to pose a question and then just sit there waiting for you. So um, if this, is, if this is not acceptable to you. I'll be glad to just do a presentation on something. So um I have some diagnostic cases we can go together, go through together, and some management cases we can go together. Is that is that good, or you guys want me to just give you give a lecture? Yeah. Why doesn't everybody uh, either get on voice or um, put in the chat uh, what your your thoughts are? Yeah, you're welcome so to we use the chat. Sure we, we meet your needs. Okay. Anybody want to send a chat? You just send a chat. Yes, no, good, bad. Let us know. If not, we're going to continue with the current platform. <laughs> uh, from this is from uh, Martha to everyone. It's so Martha says it's fine. Um, I'm I'm agreeable. I think the interactive would be good because it challenges people to use their mind rather than sitting back. Okay. All right. So why don't you put the answers in the chat? Um, I'll try to keep clicking on them to see them, or you can just unmute yourself and, and say what you think it is. So this is the first one. Uh, this is a, a patient referred to me for an incidental um, petrous apex lesion. And uh, she was sent to me to do a biopsy on her because they said this is too, the neurosurgeon said, you know, this is right up your alley. Why don't you biopsy this and let me know what this is. So I don't have the entire CT here, but you can see an axial temporal bone CT. You can see the ear canal on the right and on the left, and you can see the carotid on that side. And then you can see there's something, um, a lesion sitting in the petrous apex right here. And the first thing you, you notice here is that it is not replacing the bone marrow per se. It's very expansile as it's nice and smooth and is and in its contours. It is not destroying anything. It's just moving the bone and the bone has had the chance to remodel and get thick around it. Do you see this? So when you look at something like that, you know you're looking at most likely a very benign or at least a slow growing lesion. You're not looking at something that's fast growing. So right off the bat, you start making a differential diagnosis um, you know, what is this lesion could be. So why don't you guys put in the chat maybe five or six things that could be growing in the petrous apex right here um, that, that you know, you would need further workup to know what they are. But what are the common things that would be in this area um, having this, um, the, having this uh, characteristics? So somebody said cholesteatoma. Yes, it's, it's um, I've never actually seen a cholesteatoma grow by itself in the petrous apex. So um, the congenital cholesteatomas will grow in the middle ear and acquired cholesteatomas will also grow from the middle ear and then they ex extend into the petrous apex potentially. But there is a thought. I mean, the rest of the ear looks, the rest of the temporal bone looks perfectly normal. So um, it would be unlikely for this to 
vehicle steatoma. But as you can tell, you know, with a diffusion image, you can easily tell if this is a cholesteatoma or not, a non-echoplanar diffusion image. What else can this be? Excellent. So a cholesterol granuloma is, is, is a, you know, probably the top of your differential diagnosis. Um, it's one of the more common things that can cause so much bony remodeling. Um, it would be unusual for, a, for example, just an effusion in the petrous apex to have this because effusions don't cause this um, major um, remodeling. So glomus tumors, um, glomus tumors, you have to remember where they grow from. So the nerve, the tumor cells, the, ner the normal, I'm sorry, the normal cells that rise into glomus tumors are usually found on the dome of the jugular bulb, which would be down here somewhere. Can you guys see my arrow, by the way? Yes. Okay. It would be somewhere down here. So the glomus tumors will grow in these areas first and then go into the middle ear. The other thing they could be is the... Um, um, glomus tumors that grow from the middle ear, the tympanic plexus and the glomus tympanicum. There are actually no neuroendocrine cells in this region to create a glomus tumor. Um, so that, that wouldn't be um, on your differential. Um, carotid aneurysm is excellent. It would be unusual for the aneurysm to be this big coming off the carotid artery, but it's definitely in your differential and something you have to pay attention to. Anything else? So what about neoplasms that grow in that area? What are the more common neoplasms that grow in that area? Um, they're sort of twins that go together and radiologically they're impossible to tell apart, but histologically they are very different. Um, there you go, you, um, not, it's not chondroma, it's chordomas and chondrosarcomas. Those are the two tumors that grow in this area. And chordomas and chondrosarcomas, although they have identical signal on the MRI scans, and we can always do a lecture on, on radiology of the temporal bone if you're interested, um, they are physiologically very different. And chordomas carry about a 50% mortality rate, whereas chondrosarcoma you're looking at maybe 5% mortality rate. Although their names is counterintuitive, it's a sarcoma, but chondrosarcomas of the temporal bone are actually very well behaving tumors, unlike chondrosarcomas that grow anywhere else in the body. But chordomas are always very nasty, uh, especially when they grow in this area. They're very hard to manage and they have high rate of recurrence. And the five-year um, survival is about 50% in, in these patients. Um, Metastatic disease, as, as um, Richard said, is always, a, uh, is always um, here uh, on your differential. The only thing that goes against the metastatic disease, do you see how nice the contours are? Metastatic disease is a rapidly growing cancer. By definition, it's coming from somewhere else. So this is a tumor that's able to set up shop and rapidly grow. So it would be unusual for a met to look this nice. It would have a lot more sort of like these um, bony destruction pattern as it they grow, but it's certainly on your differential. Um, meningioma is definitely on your differential. Meningiomas usually cause a lot of hyperostosis or major bony growth around themselves, but you can have what's called an intraosseous meningioma. These are meningiomas that grow inside of the bone, not on the dura surface. They're extremely rare, uh, but you can see them in this area. Schwannoma can do this, but there is no nerve in that area that can create this schwannoma. You're, you're far too posterior and medial, for example, for a trigeminal, you know, going through foramen ovale creating this. It is a possibility of a schwannoma, definitely, if it's a large one growing from Meckel's cave down. But again, the dura, pattern, the dura leaflets don't usually allow the uh, trigeminal schwannomas to grow out of the Meckel's cave into the bone they would grow into the middle fossa or into the posterior fossa. So these are all very, very excellent, you know, thoughtful um, um, differential diagnosis that you guys came up with. Fantastic. So what is the next order of business? We're going to get an MRI scan with contrast and see what we find. So what you're looking at is an axial T1 MRI. And you can say it's T1 because the fluid is fairly dark. You can see the fluid in the prepontine cistern. 
and five is very bright. And you can also see that there is no um, contrast given. So the nasal mucosa is not bright. So you know there's, this is a pre-contrast T1. And this thing is very dark, yeah? In MRI, we say hypo intense to the brain. That is your standard, is the brain usually. You say it's either the brain or muscle, you say it's hypo intense to it. You don't say it doesn't, con doesn't enhance because you're not talking about contrast. You don't say hypoechoic because that's for ultrasound. For MRI, you say this is a hypo intense lesion and you say your reference is to the brain and it's fairly iso intense to the fluid. Yeah, and you can see the contours of it. You guys know what this is, this white region? It should have, it was supposed to go this way all the way and it's, it, and it's replaced by this lesion here. Think about what's bright on T1. Anybody wants to venture a guess? This is a normal structure right here, but instead of going down here, it's being replaced by this lesion. If I go back to the CT, it makes it easier. It's this thing. So do you know why it's so bright? Excellent. So as Martha said, that's Martha said that's clivus. But why is it so bright? Why is clivus so bright in a in an older person? What is usually in the clivus? Bone marrow, correct? The center of all the bones are is bone marrow. In the child, a bone marrow is active, so it will be gray. It will be this color. But in anybody over the age of 25, 30, most of it is now replaced with fat that clivus is no longer turning over uh, cells as much as a child does. So if you see a white signal in the clivus, that is a normal signal. The reason that's important is that even before you give a person contrast, the fat in the bones and the bone marrow of the clivus and skull base serves as a very good contrast material for you. So even if you don't give a patient contrast, you can use a signal from the fat to know if the normal bone marrow has been replaced. So say if you have a, a seven year old person and all this white has been replaced with gray, you have to start thinking this patient may have lymphoma or leukemia, uh, they may have skull based osteomyelitis, they may have cancer in there. Something is replacing the normal fat signal of the bone. Let's keep going. So now this is a T2 this is a thin sliced T2, and, and they're, they're known as KISS, which is C-I-S-S, -S, or Fiesta sequence, depending on if it's a uh, GE or Toshiba, the proprietary, the proprietary name of that sequence is either KISS or um, <clears throat> Fiesta. And you can see it very bright on T2, yeah? And you can see it's following into the normal tuberculations of the bone, and you can see, oh, there's another one on the other side. It was harder to see it on the CT, but it's actually there too. And just to give you a hint of what this thing is, I'm putting in a sagittal T1 without contrast of the patient as well. And what you wanna pay attention is how long this pituitary stalk is and how dilated this cella is and had this poor pituitary squished to the bottom all the way and has been replaced with fluid here. So what do you guys think we should do next? Should we biopsy that area as the neurosurgeon had requested? How many people say yes, go ahead and biopsy it? So Martha is po pointing out that that's called an empty cella. That's perfectly, that's, 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 that's correct. So what is our next? We have uh, good imaging data. And what do we do with this? Watch and wait, biopsy it, or do other um, workup. <laughs> Martha is being too kind. 
I mean, it is perfectly fine not to know what this thing is. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. And the idea is, first of all, doing no harm to the patient and to sort of logically thinking about what this could be. So um, Richard recommended the MRA. So the, the thinking here, if, let's go back to this. It's a lesion that looks very benign and for all intents and purposes on MRI signal looks identical to fluid. Yeah? And what is this little triangle of fluid up here? Does anybody know what that is? This is where the trigeminal nerve is gonna pass to pass through it before it gets to the cavernous sinus. If you, go, if you look, if you think back to your anatomy, what is sitting right behind the cavernous sinus and the trigeminal nerve passes through it before it gets into the cavernous sinus. There's a little cave-like structure there. There you go. So Meckel's cave is sitting there. And Meckel's cave, besides having um, the trigeminal nerve in there, it just has CSF in there. Yeah? So I give you a hint of what this may be, if this is, has identical signal to fluid, which is CSF, and if this patient has dilated empty cella, maybe it's a pocket of full of fluid. That's exactly what it is. That's all CSF you're looking at. This is all CSF here. So what is the condition that this patient has that's causing this pocket of fluid? And why is it remodeling the bone? because we all have CSF, it doesn't remodel the bone like this. There you go. This is a patient, uh, Ostap had the right answer and, and Martha referred to it as an empty cella. Patients who have empty cellas a lot of times, I mean, a lot of, not a lot of times, but many of them have intracranial hypertension. If a patient has intracranial hypertension, the fluid is going to track into all dura leaflets. They can track into the pituitary through the diaphragm here. They can go into the back of the eyes, so they can cause papilledema. And rarely they can actually cause these things. They're called Meckel's diverticulums. I'm going to put them here. They're completely benign structures. If you biopsy them, what do you give the patient now? You'll give them an active CSF leak because that area now is open and the brain will just send all the fluid out there instead of resorbing it. So the next order of business for this person would be do not biopsy them. You can do an opto eval. You have to remember this is something important to pay attention. Ophthalmology examination doesn't always rule out intracranial hypertension or what, you, what used to be called pseudotumor cerebri. It's a common myth that if somebody has a normal eye exam, a normal retinal exam, they don't have intracranial hypertension. You don't have to have papilledema to have intracranial hypertension. So very common in my practice, patients see me for pulsatile tinnitus, they see me for low frequency or, or, no, or sudden sensor and hearing loss. And we send them to opto and the opto says we don't see anything, but their MRI has the signs of intracranial hypertension. So I would get them to, I would do a lumbar puncture on them because you don't want these patients to go, go deaf. It's a very common misconception that, and you will hear it from all your ENT and all your ophthalmology colleagues that, oh, the patient had a retinal exam that was completely normal. That doesn't, exclude intracranial hypertension. So please remember that. So this patient just needs a lumbar puncture. You just want to see how bad the pressure is, how high the pressure is. You still need to do an opto examination because the intracranial hypertension will, um, will slowly, slowly cause papilledema and vision loss in them. It can cause hearing loss as well. So you need to know what the pressure is and then you can cor correct it accordingly. Any questions on this case before we go to the next one? Uh, by the way, guys, these are really, really difficult questions. So I, I hope you're not hating me already. So uh, these are not um, your typical easy questions. So I apologize in advance. Uh, 
All right, nobody's saying anything. So I assume you're either sleep, cursing me, or we'll just keep going. <laughs> nice photo, all right. So this next patient is a 57-year-old woman with history of medullary thyroid carcinoma that was, you know, that was treated 30 years ago. Um, then, as, as if that was not enough, poor thing develops non-Hunchkin's lymphoma 25 years ago, and they do a sternotomy and, and, um, to resect the tumor and give her chemo. We don't know what chemo she was given. 15 years ago, she starts having progressive right more than left sensory nerve hearing loss. Yeah? Seven weeks of severe non-positional vertigo. She has no other symptoms. She just has this constant vertigo that she cannot stop. And she doesn't have any migraine, you know, which is the common reason people have, you know, constant vertigo. She has no other uh, otologic symptoms. She's not going deaf with the episodes. She just has severe vertigo that just keeps going. When you do a VNG on the cleric, she has some weakness on the right compared to the left side. Yeah. So, so far, what is your differential on this patient? So neuroma, excellent. So an acoustic neuroma or a vestibular schwannoma can present with um, progressive hearing loss and severe non-positional vertigo. So that's one of your one of your um, differential diagnoses. One of the condition causes severe vertigo without hearing loss and it's non-positional. It's usually not seven weeks of it. Yeah, it's usually very transient, maybe 24 hours to 48 hours. So, you know, you can keep something like vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis without hearing loss on your differential. It would be unusual. Those things usually don't cost seven weeks of it. Uh, what else can be doing? Do, can, can do this? So can a stroke do this? Yeah. You have to think about, have you ever seen a patient with stroke that has ongoing vertigo attacks? Metastatic tumor of the tumors, yeah. Mets, definitely Mets are worrisome. The reason I, I wasn't as concerned about metastatic disease is that if there is metastatic disease, you would expect other neurologic symptoms as well, yeah? Mets are terrible. When the metastatic disease comes to the brain or, or temporal bone, they rarely cause one single symptom. They usually cause massive number of symptoms. But as Martha said, Martha said that this is a very, very good possibility to have, especially with somebody who's had two other, you know, history of two very bad cancers in the past. So um, strokes of the cerebellum can do this. You have to keep that on your differential. It won't be vertigo as much as it would be disequilibrium. The, balance, the patient's balance would be off more than just being spinning. Let's take a look at her hearing. This is her hearing at the time and soon after the episode happened. So what are we gonna do first? You know, get some more balance testing done, some laboratory work, some MRI. Let's go directly to the MRI. All her laboratory workup was negative. And again, this is an extremely difficult um, case. I don't want you to feel like that you have to know the answer to this. I posed this to those five experts you saw from Hopkins and Georgetown and not a single of one of them guessed this. So this is not a sim single simple thing, but let's go back to her hearing. So it looks like the right side has taken more of a hit than the left. And let's look at her images. What you're looking at here is an axial T1, and you can see it's post contrast, so the nose nasal mucosa is lighting up. The reason you don't see the fat really bright is that this is a T1 post contrast with fat suppression. So you can actually use the computer model to suppress the signal from the fat. 
So anything that's in hand that that's inherently bright on T1 and is in fact will go away once you do this. So what you're what you're looking at and is bright is just things that pick up contrast, which is usually vessels like here or tumors. When you're looking at, you can see the this is the dura that's along the petrous bone right here. These are the tiny vessels that become the inferior petrosal sinus in the pre, pre um, pontine clivus region. So this area of the dura is always bright. Yeah. If you see enhancement and bright signal on the clivus, that's completely normal. But then look what happens. The dura continues to be bright and goes all the way into the internal auditory canal. You see that? Both sides. Comes down here, goes like And then you can see this slight enhancement inside of the cochlea too a little bit. The vertical cuts look better. Look at this. The entire meninges are enhancing. Yeah. And look at that. So the meninges are not supposed to enhance. And particularly, they should never enhance inside of the uh, internal auditory canal. When they enhance inside of the internal auditory canal, there's something wrong. Now, what is your differential? Again, this is a really hard question. So, what causes diffuse meningeal enhancement? Excellent. So, meningitis is one of them. So, with meningitis, you would expect other symptoms as well, correct? But definitely, you have to consider meningitis. So, meningitis would have caused also severe headaches and high fevers, usually, if it's a viral or bacterial, neither of which this patient had. But those are excellent questions. There's a particular type of meningitis that may not cause those and usually don't see them in the United States. They're endemic to certain regions. Um, and that would be tuberculosis. So TB or tuberculosis should be higher in your differential for this, for this patient because it can cause this kind of a diffuse meningeal enhancement. What other? So if this is not infectious, and um, could it be neoplastic considering her history? There you go, autoimmune disease, perfect. That should be on your differential as well. Any neoplastic anybody can think of? Remember she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? So lymphomas can present with diffuse um, in our enhancement of the meninges. The difference is that the, in, in leukemia, lymphoma enhancements, it is not this nice and thin everywhere you would have nodularity to it. So it'd be like thin and then a nodule and a thin and a nodule of tumor. It won't be this nice and diffuse everywhere. So with that in mind, let's, let's see what, so in terms of management, meclizine would not work for this patient. She would actually get worse with it. Um, she had some, some response to steroids. She would get better. As soon as I would take it off of her, the condition would come back what that makes you think of. If you have a patient with an otologic condition, you put them on steroids, they get better. You take them off steroids, they feel worse. What are you thinking? And Martha alluded to this already. You think of autoimmune disorders, correct? If it's an autoimmune disorder, it's going to respond to steroids, at least transiently. And when you take the patient off steroids, their symptoms are going to come back. So we did a lumbar puncture, and all the laboratory, um, all the laboratory tests um, and the lumbar puncture were normal. So the protein, the glucose, all of those were normal, except for this one value, which is an ACE value. Do you guys know what that what syndrome what autoimmune disease causes elevated ACE in the blood or in the in the um, cerebral spinal fluid? The ones of you who are closer to medical school should know this better than than the rest of us. It's an autoimmune disorder that does this. Yeah, I'm, I'm 25 years, I'm one of my 20 years from medical school, so it's been a while, but. 
So this is sarcoid, yeah? It's an autoimmune disorder is called sarcoidosis. And it is a very unusual presentation of it. Usually sarcoidosis looks like this because it diffusely affects all the neurons everywhere. But it is not unusual for sarcoidosis to present with just thickness of the meninges. So if you have this kind of enhancement of the meninges, that's, that's on your differential as well, sarcoidosis. So, so we said possible um, lymphoma, tuberculosis, meningitis, unusual without other symptoms, and autoimmune, most, most commonly sarcoid would do this. All right? So far, so good. We're going to do a, do a companion case for this and see how many of you are still alive after this one. So this is a sort of a high profile downtown DC attorney. And um, he, um, he um, loves his hearing. He is an expert banjo player. And um, he comes and sees me for wax impaction. And he profusely apologizes every time to come and see a skull based surgeon to remove wax out of his ears. But he says, I don't trust my ears with anybody else. Just as luck would have it, he starts, you know, calling me, oh, I have urgent hearing loss. And of course, I'm thinking, you know, he's got more wax and we'll say, you know, fine, come on in. And he comes in and usually he has wax. But one time he comes in, he starts with this hearing and then this is the next time he has a hearing loss. So now he has a sudden hearing loss on the right side. Yeah. What is the most common reason somebody would have this condition? Let's talk um, just, this is a common entity we see, sudden sensory neuro hearing loss. Let's talk a little bit about it before we go towards this guy, what this guy actually had. But what are the common reasons? Let's say, statistically speaking, number one, this condition affects one in 10,000 people. Yeah, excellent. Idiopathic accounts for well over 90% of the patients who have sudden sensory neuro hearing loss. The rate of the condition is probably much higher than one in 10,000 that, that, uh, that has been attributed. It's probably closer to one in 1,000. In is that majority of these patients, they have transient hearing loss. The hearing loss goes away. They never come to see us. Yeah. These, these epidemiologic studies come from the data of the patients who actually went to see a doctor. But it is possible many patients have transient hearing loss and the hearing corrects itself after a few hours and the patients never see us. So, all right, idiopathic, what else? So if your patient has idiopathic, it has a sensory neuro hearing loss, what else could be the cause? Vascular, yes, so you can have an infarct, yeah. Um, it would be very unusual for an infarct to present with, with moderate hearing loss with, without anything else. If you think about this tiny little vessel, the, the um, ICA branch known as a labyrinthine artery, as it's coming and supplying the entire inner ear, if there is a clot in that thing, patient will have profound hearing loss and they will be completely vertiginous because you're cutting off the blood supply of the inner ear. But if you have a stroke, if you have a vascular issue, even proximal to that, like you have it in the lateral loop of ICA, now you're going to have a Wardenberg syndrome and a brainstem syndrome. So they will have paralysis and numbness and all kinds of stuff. So it's very unusual for that. Uh, Marta put in the two other ones, which are very good. One, schwannomas can do that. Yeah. So always remember, if you have a patient with true sudden sensor neuro hearing loss, even if the sensory neuro hearing loss goes away, always get an MRI. I have a collection of patients in my practice that, had, that have vestibular schwannomas, they have acoustic neuromas, they presented with sudden hearing loss, the hearing loss went away by itself, and the doctor never ordered the MRI. They said, well, it, went, it got better, there must be nothing in there, so they never ordered the MRI. So always order an MRI with sudden sensory neuro hearing loss. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for the um, clinical practice guidelines that the American Academy develops. I don't know um, if, uh, Richard, you have shared those with our, with our friends. Um, 
uh, there's 13 or 14 of them now. There's one on Meniere's we just did. There's one on tinnitus. There's one on sudden hearing loss, one on facial nerve paralysis. There's one even on wax impaction, cerumen impaction. But these are, they, they, it costs us you know, a few hundred thousand dollars to develop because there's not only dozens of experts that come together from different specialties, we review every double-blinded study, every Cochrane review, every study ever published on the topic. So if you want to ever know what is the best sort of evidence-based diagnostic and treatment modalities for a particular condition, always see if there is a clinical practice guideline done by our academy. And then you can look at Cochrane Review. That's the second place I always go to. So um, um, if you don't have it, you can just Google clinical practice guideline and, um, and it will come up on the American Academies. And they're free. You don't need to um, sign in for anything. The PDF is available uh, for free. And it comes in doctor's version and the patient's version. They can download both and, and use them for your practice. Another you, great. Why don't you send okay. me the link later in an email and I'll put it on the website or the chat for everybody, okay? Sure, sure. The other um, great point that uh, Martha made was Meniere's disease. Yes, you can have cochlear high drops. A lot of times, cochlear high drops presents with low frequency loss but it doesn't mean it can't present with mid and high frequency. So that's certainly something to keep in mind as well. So that's another great point, Martha. Perfect. So this is his presentation and I gave him steroids. Hearing went back up. His sound clarity went back to 96%. And he comes back again. Yeah. Hearing is down even further this time. And first time he said, no, I don't want an MRI. I said, you have to get an MRI. He said, I don't want an MRI. I don't want to get a needle in my arm to get contrast. When this happened, I said, you absolutely have to get an MRI. So we got an MRI and this is what the MRI shows. What are you guys thinking? So this is most likely not an acoustic, correct? You don't see any lesions in, inside the internal auditory canals. Yeah, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. It's not many ears. Many ears, remember, by definition, is idiopathic. All right, there's a link to all the clinic practice guidelines. I just put that in the chat for you. And when you go in there, you can find the different ones. There's, I think, yeah, there's uh, just over 12 of them. You can download them at your convenience. Yeah, these are hard, hard images. So guys, uh, if you want at any times, I can do it. Another talk on MRIs of the, of the temporal bone, because um, as ENTs and neurotologists, we need to be better and in reading these than neuroradiologists, because this is something you do for daily, you know, you know, on a daily basis. So we need to be very, very good at them. Um, what do you guys think? So at least describe for me what are you seeing that's abnormal. So this is, you know, post contrast T1, correct? There's contrast in nasal mucosa. There's fat suppression, so you don't see the fat. The fluid is dark, so you know this is a T1 post contrast and with fat suppression. And you can see, look at the meninges, the dura. You see how thick it is here and here. And then look at the coronals. Look at that. There and there. Look at the thickness of this. It's supposed to be paper thin. What is your differential now? What do you think is going on with this patient? There's a handful of conditions that kind of cause this, and we went over a few of them already, correct? So this is no different than the previous patient. This patient can have sarcoid. They can have lymphoma, they can have tuberculosis, they can have some form of meningitis besides tuberculosis. But for this particular image, there's two other conditions that you need to consider. One is called intracranial hypotension. These are patients that instead of having increased pressure of the CSF, 
they have a decreased pressure of the siesta and their brain starts to sag down. You see the brain is like moving down. And what happens is as the brain, there's not enough fluid in there, the vasculature inside of the dura, the little veins we have inside of the dura, they engorge and expand. And as they engorge and expand, they pick up contrast. And you can see this very thick layer of dura everywhere. So this is something that you see. Um, the radiologic terminology for this is called, the radiologic terminology for this is called pachymeningitis. Let me put it in the chat here. Pachymeningitis just means thick meninges. That's all it means. It's not a disease. It's a radiologic finding. The differential diagnosis for pachymeningitis is, we talked about the common ones. The sarcoid. I'm going to mute Dr. Figuera for a second. Um, it's, it's sarcoid. We talked about um, lymphoma, tuberculosis. Um, intracranial, hypertens intracranial hypotension. And there's another condition that was recently discovered, and it's an IgG4 myeloproliferative disorder. It's a rare condition, but sometimes shows up on board exams. These are, it's a form of, a, it's, it's analogous to multiple myeloma, and this, these are B cells that produce large amount of IgG4 uh, antibodies. And what you're looking at is, is, is these cells that have invaded the meninges and they create this very smooth pachymeningitis everywhere. Now, this patient um, said, it is what it is, I don't want anything done, and left it alone, and voila, his hearing came back up. And we said, fine, let it be. Then his left ear goes down again. He would not let me do a lumbar puncture. I begged him to let me do a lumbar puncture and he would not let me. So his um, left ear goes down and I do another MRI. This is four years later. Now look at the meninges. They are so thickened and entering, entering into the IAC. It's so bad. If I show you the Fiesta, Look at the Fiesta. This is the meninges on the Fiesta. You never see meninges on Fiesta. They're, they're so thin, you can't see them. But in this gentleman, you can see they're actually invading into the internal auditory canal on both sides. And he still doesn't let me do a lumbar puncture on him. So um, there is a, um, there, he has had a, um, he's had a spine surgery many, many years ago. And the idea, the thought was he may have been leaking CSF uh, all these years through that area. It was not high on the differential because people who constantly leak CSF and they have intracranial hypotension, a lot of times they have headaches, especially when they go from a resting position, they stand up, they get a headache because the brain actually hits the walls and they get a headache. And he's never had any symptoms. So for years, he didn't let me even do an MRI on him. But eventually I was able to convince him to let me at least do an MRI of his lumbar area when he had the um, um, spine surgery two decades ago and the lumbar area looks fine. For these patients, um, if you do a lumbar puncture and they actually have intracranial hypotension, so the pressure is um, below, you know, five, for example, it's like four or five in that region, then uh, you want to um, scan their entire spine because there are case reports of people having spontaneous CSF leak um, through this diverticulum into the neck or down into, this, into the thoracic or, or lumbar spine and it will cause this picture. But um, the, the thing for the, for, to do for this gentleman is he should have let me do a lumbar puncture and then a biopsy to see what this thing is because he keeps going deaf despite the fact he's so worried about his hearing but he does not want any kind of intervention. So. It is what it is, so we leave him alone. So those are my diagnostic cases. Everybody is still okay? Any questions? All right. So with that in mind,
we can switch to some management cases. Again, these are not um, simple cases, so forgive me if there are too much. All right, so let's do some management cases. So we have a patient, I lost the chat box for some reason. Let me see where's the chat box. Anyway, I, I wait for you guys to type something in there. All right. Richard, can you type something in your chat box? I, I seem to have lost it. There you go, thank you. All right. So we have a 47 year old pharmacist. Um, she had a right stapes surgery 20 years ago. And she said, right after surgery, I developed severe vertigo attack. I was admitted to the hospital for the few days. And the doctor said, oh, it's okay. You just had, you know, just your body's reaction to the surgery. After that, she had um, stable hearing loss for a few years and then starts having ear infections. And she's wearing a hearing aid at the time. And it's become a nightmare for her because when she puts a hearing aid in, she gets more infections. She doesn't put a hearing aid, she can't hear. She also has developed this issue that if she does any manipulation of the ear by pressing the tragus or put by putting the hearing aid, or if you do any kind of suctioning, or if you do um, um, like a temp tympanogram on her, she will get, get a severe jolt of vertigo. So Tulio and Hennebert, correct? With loud noises, she gets vertigo. With, um, with pressure changes, she gets vertigo. In the last year, she now has two episodes of bilateral left more than right hearing loss. It was treated with oral steroids and IT dex, dexamethasone with some improvement. Now to make your life easier, I give you the answer here that a lot of her vertigo attacks were actually vestibular migraine attacks. This patient on top of everything here has severe migraines. So she gets a lot of vertigo attacks with classic headache, visual changes, and ear pressure and so on and so forth. So to show you the hearing test, this is her audiogram when she's doing good. The left ear is up here, the right ear down here. You can see she has a major conductive component these are the markings for the right ear. These are the marking for the left ear. And these are right with bone, with masking, you can see. And she has, you know, anywhere from 10, 20, 30, 40, 45 decibel to 30 decibel air bone gap. So the prosthesis is obviously not working really well for her on this side. Then she has a decline on the left side in her better ear. Yeah. So she starts having a sudden sensory nerve hearing loss on the left side. We give her some steroids. She has some improvement on both sides. Yeah, let me show you her examination. This is what her ear looks like. It's a wide uh, meatus, but a very, very narrow medial canal. You can barely see her TM back here. And this is sort of a pink hue growing circumferentially. And this is what her CT looks like, yeah? So what are your thoughts so far? So Martha said minor syndrome or, su or, semi or superior semicircular canal dehiscence. So one idea is that this patient did not have otosclerosis and had SSCD and it was mimicking it. And, you know, you would expect that, you know, if you go in as a surgeon, if you haven't had a CT scan and you didn't see the superior canal dehiscence, if you go in and the patient has um, normal mobile foot plate, you back off and you realize you don't have otosclerosis. But there are rare instances that patients have both. They have otosclerosis and superior canal dehiscence. So it's nice to get a CT if you can on these patients, um, especially if they have any vertigo or anything ahead of time. But all of these patient symptoms came after surgery, yeah? She did not have Tulio, Hennebert, none of that. These all are iatrogenic. So they, they started after um, she had the surgery. So if you do a stapes and your patient has severe vertigo after surgery, 
they wake up with severe vertigo. What is your first thought? What is happening to the patient? Infection, yeah. Infection won't be immediate, correct? If you do the surgery, they wake up and they're severely vertiginous. They are not, um, you don't think infection, you think inflammation, correct? So they are having a labyrinthitis. Um, you can have a perilymph fistula, you can have a long prosthesis, those are all correct. So you have to worry that the perilymph is just free flowing and leaking out. It would be unusual because you've put in a blood patch or perichondrium or vein or something, but it can happen. Um, The other issue is um, if the prosthesis is too long, that's perfectly correct, that's, that's accurate. Uh, you can have a granuloma and oval window. Granulomas and oval window usually take time to develop and it's sort of a historic issue. You almost never see them anymore because the reason people develop granulomas and oval window is they, the, the uh, few years in the 50s and 60s that people used gel foam. Um, as a prosthetic. So they would have a wire, they would tie gel foam to it, and they put it as a prosthetic, and the gel foam would become a granuloma. Um, in modern era, you never see them with the Teflons or the, the titanium or stainless steel or platinum. None of those uh, um, I've seen create granulomas. I guess it's always a possibility, but. Ashkan, one of the things I heard was that the gel foam in the past was processed with formaldehyde. And it was mm -hmm. really the formaldehyde that caused yes. the granuloma. Very true. Very true. Very true. But I mean, I haven't, I haven't even seen a patient who's had a wire um, gel foam. And it, it's been so long since that practice was abandoned, but that's absolutely correct. Um, all right. So on the CT scan, before I go into what's wrong with this patient, what you're looking at is a condition known as medial canal stenosis means the medial, the internal part, closer to the middle, the medial part of the external auditory canal is becoming stenotic. And you can see the thickened skin here and here and the drum. The most common reason people have this is chronic otitis media. I'm sorry, chronic otitis externa. This, this patient has it because she wears a hearing aid and she constantly gets infection after infection. The differential for for um, this condition is, you can see it in graft versus host disease, patients who have had um, bone marrow transplant. I see it in patients with um, autoimmune disorders. This is a very bizarre condition because you have to remember the skin of the external auditory canal is very different on the medial and the lateral portion. The medial canal skin, which is what you're looking at here, is a very specialized skin. It's the only skin in the body that sits on bone. There's no soft tissue underneath it. And it's very, um, I found a lot of patients over the years that they have patients have sensitivities or as part of their autoimmune disorder, they develop uh, severe thickness in the area. Um, I've seen it with detergents, I've seen it with cosmetics, um, with certain food items, um, artificial dyes, people get these things. The body reacts and the skin in the area keeps getting wet and moist and thickened and becomes diseased over time. So that's, that's in your differential. But for this patient, it was clear cut because she was wearing a hearing aid and causing chronic infections that's doing this. Let's look another at her cause, CT scan. Another cause. Excuse me, Ashkan. Yes. Did you say it was related to food? I missed that part because we are like organizing dinner and I didn't, I didn't <laughs> pick it up. Sorry, it, what did yeah. you say? Can you please repeat it just shortly for me? Thank you. Of course. So medial canal stenosis is not an allergic response. The lateral canal is like eczema, psoriasis. It's a skin that you have everywhere else. So the lateral canal um, um, chronic otitis is usually from an allergen. Um, uh, the medial canal a lot of times is autoimmune disorders, um, but you can see it with detergents and with sometimes with food as well. The the Pathophysiology, I, I don't think it's allergies. I think it's reactive, but um, those are the things you have to watch out for when patients have this. Um, Richard, you were saying something? Yeah, it can also come from post tympanot, any kind of surgery of the ear, can, ear canal or middle ear. Uh, Absolutely. Inflammatory uh, reaction to the healing process. Yeah, 
I see this very commonly with lateral, um, lateral grafting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm going to uh, show you the next one and we can uh, stop here. Um, I don't know who's, who's drawing on the screen, but um, so this is the CT at the level of the prosthesis. Do you see it? Do you guys agree this is way too far in? in the you have to remember metal prostheses tend to exaggerate because they scatter. So if you see a metal prosthesis inside of the vestibule, they may not be as far as you think inside. The tip of it may be just scattered, but this is almost touching the, the, the inner bone of the otic capsule. So it's definitely touching the, the area. So there's another finding here. Do you guys see this? Look at it here. I'll go another slice higher. You can see it better. What is going on here? Separation of the joint. Yep. What do you think happened during surgery? The surgeon screwed up. This is an incus dislocation. And very commonly happens as you're curetting that scutum. If your hand slips, you can actually dislocate the incus. And if that happens, don't continue with the surgery if the incus is floppy. The incus is floppy and you put a prosthetic on it and then close up, a lot of times the incus is just gonna continue downwards and the prosthesis will go far into the vestibule. And this is what happened to this poor patient. The reason the prosthesis is too long is not that the surgeon made a mistake in measuring the length, is that he didn't realize he's actually dislocated this patient's incus. So anyway, long story short, I put on migraine supplements, her vertigo attack started getting better, put on steroids. Um, and then um, um, started managing her ear canal, took the hearing aid out, and she started getting better and better and better over time. And I actually have never operated on her. So far, she's done well, and I've left it alone. Um, she actually now started to put her hearing aid back in and, um, and, and get back to work. But I'm, unfortunately, I have a 2 o'clock meeting in one minute, so I have to stop here. If there's a quick question, I'll be glad to answer right now. I don't have any questions. I think some, you know, fascinating cases. I mean, <laughs> as I told you, Ashkan comes from a different planet, so he's really got some experience that, you know, is is beyond comprehension. Sometimes you are too kind, Richard. So the yeah. thing is, and, if you guys get very difficult cases, please put them on the chat, and we'll make sure Ashkan gets gets hold of them, okay? And we'll give you his opinion. Yeah. But I, you know, just a little. Yeah, bit, you can. Go, just a little thing. You can always, go ahead. you can always push. Um, if you have um, life image, you can push the images to me. Um, um, you can, I'm also on um, uh, Nucleus, so you can find me. It's a free website. I'll put it in here. Um, Nucleus IO is a company that um, allows you to share films in a HIPAA compliant way, and you can find my last name there, and you can share the images with me. Um, uh, or just at least send me an email and, and I'll be glad to be of help. Okay. I'm going to sign off here, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashkan. We'll talk soon. Bye, everybody. Of course. Always a pleasure. Take care, everybody. Bye, Marta. Everybody, listen, uh, we'll be communicating through uh, WhatsApp. Bye-bye. Appreciate everybody joining today. And uh, I will post next week's lectures this weekend. Um, Okay. Bye, Ashkan. Um, bye, bye, bro. And uh, if anybody has any questions, um, like I say, just put them on the platform. We'll get them to Ashkan. He's he's easy to connect with. And um, uh, again, have a good weekend. Um, and we'll be joining next week again. All right. Thanks for taking your Friday morning or afternoon or evening to join us. All right. Thank you, everybody.